All right. Welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. You're in the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And tonight's a very special night. As you can see, um, I, I mentioned last week, if you were here, I mentioned that last week when we introduced the 10 Bhumi stages, the 10 stages of the Bodhisattva path, I mentioned last week that that's why I wanted to do this sutra, that, that this part of the sutra about the 10 stages, this is, this is what I was so excited about. And it took us a while to get there, a uh, number of hours, many weeks, many sessions, and we got there and, and, and now it just continues. Now it really, the excitement continues about why I, I was hoping to share this with you. Um, and tonight's gonna be a very interesting night. I have, I have a lot to say about, about this, about, about what's about to happen. Um, yeah, it's gonna be a maybe dense, <laughs> and it's not it's not often I say that <laughs> right so uh you you've been forewarned um that we're going to be talking about a lot of different ideas tonight I started to prepare us last week I started mentioning Carl Jung archetypes and all of these ideas, I was actually preparing us for tonight for what's about to happen, where, you know, this, this sutra that's been going along, and yeah, it's been a little, it's been dense, it's been interesting, but now it gets, it gets wild. It gets wild tonight. And so, just, you know, let me not... Let me calm. Let, let me calm down. <laughs> I, you know, I'm so excited to get into this. <laughs> Happy Valentine's Day, by the way, everybody. I really um, like big love, big hug, big hearts. Yeah. Um, but so we we started this sutra, Bodhisattva Akshayamati, Bodhisattva Inexhaustible Intellect wondering about the bodhisattva path and the buddha told us about the 10 paramitas and then gave us these 10 practices for each of the paramitas and and then after all of that the the buddha is about to speak on and it, what's interesting is last week of course all i did was introduce these uh, these 10 stages i don't even think we read a word from the sutra. I think I just introduced the 10 stages. And so tonight is actually why I, I bothered to introduce you to these and the very idea of this. Um, you know, I mentioned last week about the idea of stages. This is nothing new to Buddhism. Buddhism is all about stages. It's all about the idea of cultivation and progress in that sense. And so I'll just, I'll just start. I'll just start with where we're at in the sutra. The Buddha says, furthermore, virtuous one, when a bodhisattva, mahasattva, is about to abide in the first stage of pramudita, great joy, the first stage of bodhisattva development. The bodhisattva will first have a vision. And I'm not even gonna tell you what the vision is. I'm not even gonna tell you what the vision is because I actually, we need to talk about what's about to happen. We gotta talk about the language involved here. You know, I mean, when I, you know, when I first read the sutra and I was like, wow, the Bodhisattva is having a vision. This is, this is significant. It's, it is significant because what we're talking about is the, is a Bodhisattva, a enlightenment seeker who is about, about to start ascending the stages to, to, towards Buddhahood. 
And this is saying, and by the way, I was right then I was reading from the standard English translation in which they use this word vision. And I'm not entirely opposed. I'm not at all opposed to using the language of having a vision. But I do want to, before we even talk about the vision, where, you know, again, like, don't peek. Um, before we get into that, this is, this is, um, yeah, let, let's do the, let's do the, the, the hard work first. Let's do the hard work first so that we can have fun later. That sound good, right? So the hard, the hard work that, that we need to do is I have Bodhisattva Akshayamati here. He's got the Chinese. And, and of course, we're, we are reading originally, we're reading a Chinese version that's been translated into English, but we're referring to the original. And the Chinese has this idea. Uh, it's a four character first. So before the Bodhisattva is about to enter the first stage of Pramudita, this in immense great joy, they'll, they will first, there's no problem with the, with the first Chinese character there. They will xian, they will first have this, and then I'm using a, a particular language here of sign. So here's what's going on here tonight, folks. <clears throat> the character here that's being translated as vision, have a vision that looks, that's going to look something wild like this. The actual language that the sutra uses is that they will, that the bodhisattva will first have this, and then the word that's being translated as vision or sign, it's actually our classic Chinese character that is used for the idea of a lakshana, a characteristic or quality, an attribute, a sign, signifier. This is an idea that we play with in the Dharma doors all the time. We're always dealing with this idea of of a lakshana. And tonight's a night that I'm going to share with you a little bit more about that idea. And it's and, and I'm doing that in order to make sense of how you can then make this leap to having a vision and, and what that might possibly mean here. There's a very uh, tricky way to translate this character, it's a xiang. And this character, it could mean appearance. To have the appearance of, um, and this is where it gets very tricky because you have to think about something like, um, you know, if I were to hold something like this up, right? If you didn't catch that, right? It, it appears, it appears to be a book. <laughs> that, that English word appear <laughs> is what we're talking about, which is that it has the appearance. And in English, when we say that something appears to be, meaning it has the appearance of, we are, at, we are referring to its qualities or characteristics or signs or marks, what, the, what in Sanskrit would be called lakshana. So the first thing we need to, to kind of deal with is, is that we are talking about this sort of the appearance of something, something appearing a certain way. But then where it gets really tricky is like that in English, if we were to say the, the redness, the redness, N-E-S-S. -S. The, 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 when we add that to a word, uh, an adjective, right? The redness of it, the bigness, the, the, it's like we are also referring to that characteristic or the quality, the ness, right? 
And all of these ideas are, the reason why I'm telling you all of this is that in, a, the, in the world of Buddhism, there are certain qualities or characteristics that the bodhisattva sh should not have, should not have. And they are the characteristics or qualities of a self, individuality. These are qualities or characteristics that are discussed in a very famous sutra, the Vajra Sutra, the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra, otherwise known as the Diamond Sutra. And the only reason why I'm going through the hard work at the beginning is to, to explain that there's this very complicated use of language in the Diamond Sutra, in the Vajra Sutra, where it says that the Bodhisattva should not have, yo, certain xiang certain characteristics or qualities. Ultimately, actually, the, 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 the Vajra Sutra says the Bodhisattva shouldn't have any qualities or characteristics. But what's tricky about translating the Vajra Sutra into English is that this, this have characteristics, it's operating both ways in terms of that the bodhisattva doesn't have them have characteristics this way or that way in the perception of the world. And this is a really important linguistic clue to how the, Buddha, how the Chinese Buddhists were thinking about these characteristics or qualities. What I'm saying is to put this very quickly, shortly, I've been translating the Vajra Sutra for a very long time, and the particular linguistic structure of bodhisattvas having or not having lakshana, not having or not having characteristics or qualities, is kind of a, a philosophical linguistic conundrum of like, what does that mean? What does that mean that they're like, Bodhisattvas themselves don't have characteristics or they don't think of the world in terms of characteristics. It's like, it all gets very tricky, but this is a big clue to what, the, what they're talking about. And so to wind this back to our sutra, and I apologize for the hard work of that, but it's sort of necessary Bringing it back to the sutra, the idea is, is like, oh, before a bodhisattva enters the first Bhumi stage, they will have this appearance, this, and this is where we are to understand, oh, so this does not pertain to the bodhisattva this way. It actually pertains to a sort of, sort of way of seeing the world. And so before, right before, or I don't know when, but before the Bodhisattva is about to enter the first stage, they will have this appearance. And again, I don't think it's referring to this appearance. It means that they will see something. And this is what they will see. I, this is the vision. I'm, I'm going to read from the standard one, but I'm going to change it a little bit. When a bodhisattva mahasattva is about to abide in the stage of pramudita, great joy, they will first have a vision of a hundred thousand million myriad of myriads of hidden treasures within a billion-fold world universe. That's the vision. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. <laughs> so we got the hard work out of the way. Forget what I, everything I just said. That was all for posterity's sake regarding language and linguistics. But what we're talking about tonight is that a bodhisattva 
right before they're about to abide in the first stage. And we talked about the 10 stages, so I'm not going to go over that tonight. But before, and, and by the way, of course, these are the 10 stages of development. And this is before you even start. <laughs> this is like before you get to that first stage. And so the, the first thing we're going to do tonight is we're going to break down the vision. We're going to break down what this particular xiang, this particular characteristic, this particular appearance. There's a few different um, elements. And, and actually, basically, there's only two elements. One is this one. And everybody who's been coming to the Dharma doors or knows my, my Dharma teachings, they know about this. This is a, a world system, a lokadatu. We live in a world system or a lokadatu. And, you know, it, it, you know the San Francisco Dharma, uh, the San Francisco Dharma Collective has a really great video on Buddhist cosmology that you could watch to learn all about the idea of this, uh, where these come from. But just like this one, I drew this one pretty big. This is our standard world system, which is an axis mundi, a kind of a giant mountain in the middle of our world, surrounded by continents, floating on a disc of uh, golden crusted earth, which is on top of a fiery molten crust, which is on top of a watery crust, which is on top of a wind crust or a wind vortex. And there's a sun and a moon and stars, and we live in a world system. But the Mahayana Buddhists, they love talking about the three, a 3,000 great thousand world system which is not just one of these, but if I were to gather together a collection of a thousand worlds, that would be what's called a small world system. A thousand planets, basically. If I had a thousand of those, that would be a middle a, a, a middle size, medium size world system. And then if I had a thousand of those, otherwise a thousand, thousand, thousand in that way, a billion, that would be a 3,000, a three great thousand world system. You might see this translated as a trichiliocosm. So that's the first thing that we're dealing with is the idea of not just our world that we live in, but a sort of, you know, many of those worlds, worlds upon worlds upon worlds upon worlds. And I've done Dharma talks about this in the past in terms of sometimes it sounds like Buddhists are talking about parallel worlds where it's like, every manifestation of this world, every version of this world, every permutation of this world. Other times it seems like they're kind of talking about the cosmos at large and galaxies and nebula and all of that. Other times it seems to be talking about um, the myriad, the myriad subjective experiences we're all having, the myriad worlds that are coexisting here. There's a variety of ways of thinking about what the Buddhists mean by having not just one world system, but a thousand of them and a thousand of those, and then a thousand of those gatherings of a thousand of a thousand. But that's what's being spoken about, first of all. Yeah, Tanya. So in this case, it's the planets. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, well, no, I do. I mean, I, it's not that I know. I don't know anything, but I have ideas. I got a lot of ideas. And I plan to share all of those ways of imagining this. So hold on on that. 
let me just explain the other part. So the, the first part is that the bodhisattva who's about to abide in the first stage of great joy has a vision of seeing within. So the, the way the, the sentence structure is, and it's, by the way, a very complicated sentence, <laughs> but it seems to be saying that the bodhisattva will see and by the way, it's see with the eyes insofar as, you know, we can trust these things. Like there are words for perceive, know, understand. And this is actually the word for to perceive with the eyes. So that's another thing that lends itself to translating this as having a vision. Because it seems to be that you'll kind of see this in some way. And you're going to see within a a trichiliocosm within a billion worlds, within the 3,000 great thousand world system, the bodhisattva will see hundreds of thousands of millions of nayutas of masses, this is my translation, by the way, of masses of jeweled hidden treasuries. So first of all, we know what a hundred is. We know what a thousand, we know what a million is, but within the world of Buddhism and kind of um, Sanskrit wonderfulness, they have a, a something called a nayuta. And a nayuta seems to be basically like a, a zillion. Yeah, you heard me right, a zillion. So the way that we have in English, we have these really interesting words that don't actually refer to something, but they kind of do, like a zillion. A zillion is a really big number. It's bit way bigger than a billion, trust me. And there's a way in which these numbers, like a zillion, are very useful, <laughs> they're wonderful. And a nayuta seems to be that kind of number, like a, a really, really big number. And so first of all, the bodhisattva is going to see within a trichilia cosm, a hundred, is going to see hundreds of thousands of millions of zillions of nayutas of masses, heaps, collections, gatherings. The Chinese is very vague here. It refers to a kind of mass, a mass of jeweled. And then this beautiful idea of a, a uh, let me get the tones right, the fu zhang, hidden treasuries. We've encountered hidden treasuries in other sutras. Um, so I just want to know that this is not a new idea. Before we get too carried away, I have here, of course, this kind of uh, sea of jewel. It's raining. It's raining jewels. Our, our escalator ladder to enlightenment is now jewel encrusted. And our bodhisattva, to the best of to the best of my artistic abilities, I have tried to present to you a vision of a, of, of of innumerable jeweled treasuries hidden within myriads of worlds. That's what I've tried to to show you here. And of course, you know, this is a cartoon trying to you know catch what's going on here in this first vision of the bodhisattva. And if you've been coming to the Dharma doors, studying with me, you know, you know, these jewels are very interesting. Jeweled treasuries are very interesting. I actually don't even know where to start. I don't know where to start. With the jewels, the tr hidden treasuries, I don't know where to start. Let's start. Let's start with 
the hidden treasuries. I think it's going to be better if we start with hidden treasuries. So the hidden part is interesting. It's it's not apparent to the eye. It's it's a uh, um, mysterious where these treasuries are. Great, we've we, we've dealt with hidden. But these treasuries, you know, Bo the Buddhists, they love their imagery and their metaphors. And so you would think of like a treasure chest or a vault, right? And what's beautiful about this word, it's the, the, the word zang. It's, um, one of my, it's one of my favorite Chinese characters, one of my favorite Chinese ideas, Chinese Buddhist ideas. And yes, it means actually the 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 um, the Chinese character, the actual pictograph refers to an armory because there's some actual in the pictogram, there's weaponry being put under a casing. So it's an armory, but then it becomes the idea of like a storehouse, place to put a bunch of stuff. Okay. But the word, Zong, which gets which can be translated as a treasury. It's also this very important Buddhist idea for what would be called a matrix. It's actually even the English word, as I've said, matrix comes from a Buddhist idea, matrika. And that idea of matrika as a, a wu, and actually the word zong, which is translated as treasury, translated as matrix can also be translated as a womb. And so it's this kind of really profound idea of like, well, if you go to the idea of a matrix, this idea of a profound amount of information being kind of like stuffed into very small bits in a way, that's kind of this idea of a, of a garba, and that's the, the, the Sanskrit for this idea of a, a treasury is a garba. And indeed the word garba means both a womb but, and this idea of a matrix um, storehouse. So it's a kind of a very interesting idea there. And I think if I start talking about the jewels, it, it might start to bring about the deeper meaning of this, right? So uh, it's so tricky where to start with all of this, but there's a, um, you know, <laughs> there's a very funny Buddhist thing going on with all of these jewels. And the idea about it is, of course, is that, you know, if you were, if you were a, an, if you were an unenlightened being, Right, because I, I know you're an enlightened being. So, but if you were an unenlightened being, right, you might be prone to thinking that gold and silver and diamonds and rubies and emeralds, those are like precious and valuable, right? And they might be precious and valuable due to their scarcity, or due to their luster or due to their beauty, right? And, and right away, of course, because I, I know that you're all quite enlightened, you're sitting there thinking, but Michael, those are of course all very relative ideas, beauty and luster and rarity. You know, it's like, what happens when they find that giant mound of gold, a whole mountain of gold and all of a sudden gold is worthless, right? So, you know, the reason why gold is sort of precious is because of its scarcity, but if it weren't so scarce all of a sudden, it wouldn't be so precious. And then of course, aesthetic evaluations of luster and beauty, we know that those are sort of kind of arbitrary in that way. And so one, one, one way, one way of being Buddhist is that deep equanimous way where there's sort of like all things are kind of equal in that sense. And that's a very beautiful, uh, precious place to be in actually, that kind of all things being equal, equanimous, upeksha. 
But what I think of the Mahayanists are the Mahayana Buddhists, what I think they're one of the things, I have a lot to say about this, these jewels, by the way, but one of the things that I think that they're playing with is that it is to the unenlightened that says, yeah, these, these are precious jewels. Forget about those. But what about the mind that truly sees the precious jewel that is the Avatamsaka Sutra? That invaluable, rare, precious jewel, right? Or how about a pencil? What an invaluable thing in this world, right? This is this like, what a jewel, what a gem. And so the first thing that I'm kind of started getting at in terms of what might be the Bodhisattva's vision of a hundreds of thousands of billions of naiutas of jeweled treasuries hidden within the 3000 world system the first thing I'm suggesting is it might be the mind that doesn't say this is valuable, that's not valuable, but the mind that is actually overwhelmed with the value of everything, the preciousness of everything. Yeah, yeah Tanya. So, yeah, well, when you describe the like numbers of things, and I was thinking like, the trillion, billion, blah, zillion, I was like, well, it's got to be the jewels make up everything. And that, and that, like, it's like, it's just, there's some sort of hidden beauty below, I mean, below it all, right? Because it is everything, right? Is that kind of uh. like, I mean, I, I was just thinking just from a numbers perspective, I was like, well, it's got to be everything. And then it's like, yeah, so does that make sense? Not only does it, it make it, sense. And it's the beauty of everything, but it's hidden underneath, but it's there. You nailed it. You not only did you nail it, but you you said what I didn't say and that I meant to say, which was exactly that is like that it's it's um that these I, I these numbers are alluding to that. It's what they want you to understand is that it's it's that exactly that Tanya exactly what you just said is that when the Mahayana Buddhists start giving in these numbers, it's not that they have such large amounts in mind. They're trying to do exactly what you, the realization you just had of like, oh, wow, that's, that's what they're alluding to. It's pretty beautiful. I mean, it's totally really, beautiful. Yeah, it's a beautiful, uh, it's a beautiful vision for them to have as they step up this ladder. And we have, we have places to go. <laughs> Any other questions or comments just about where we're at right now? So right now we just understand, okay, so there's this uh, a kind of mind blowing cosmology of a billion world systems. That, that unto itself, by the way, is like kind of challenging. And then we're adding this kind of jewel metaphor but they're sort of describing sort of the, well, what we did, just talked about was the sort of beautiful value of every individual thing as a jewel in that way. Let's, everybody ready to go a little further with this? So there's a... Um, Michael, I have a question actually, yeah. because you, I, as I know, you're also very familiar with cosmology. Um, what is cosmology? There is no, I mean, it just comes to my mind because I read a scientific book. There's no, like there's, that's, there's not the idea that um, the jewels have any relation to the, not the, to the idea, but to the existence of atoms, no? It has nothing to do with it, right? I actually, uh, Connie, I, I don't, I, it, the reason why I'm hesitating is because I, I was thinking about that actually. Um, and I do, I do think that there is a way it's there's a way like that kind of in a maybe not atoms but if you look at the periodic table in that sense 
And mm -hmm. some of those are valued and some of them are not in that way. But as the constituent elements of our reality, they should in a way all be valued. And then maybe even at the atomic level too. So I think the way that you're thinking, Connie, is is actually totally in line with what this is talking about. And what I mean is, is that I think this is talking about a lot simultaneously. There's not any one read on this. Okay. So okay. I would I'd just be like, yeah, I, I definitely feel like there's this sort of, um, um, yeah, that kind of thinking going on. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I'm just thinking because Buddha was also a scientist and works so much about reality. And then you have this, you know, quantum physics coming up and exploring. And um, anyway, so I just, I think I've been trying to find the um, synergies and or the intersection between um, Buddhist um, teachings and, and what um, science is discovering these days. So yeah, this is where I am right now. So <laughs> anyway, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so what I was about to head to was, so I want to give you a, uh, like, um, know what you call it exactly. It's not a history. Uh, it's sort of a genealogy, I guess you could say. Uh, but it's an, it's where where this, this language is coming from, this uh, language of, um, of world systems, uh, uh, billions of them, and the language of jewels. So this is, this is sort of, um, I, um, yeah, this, I'm just um, gonna put this out there. I've already mentioned the Pranya Paramita Sutra, the Vajra Pranya Paramita Sutra once, and I can't really stress how important that sutra is to, to Mahayana Buddhism. Um, I've said this before in Dharma talks that that particular sutra seems to be the turning point from the old type of Buddhism, call it uh, Shravaka Yana, call it Hinayana, call it Theravada, but that kind of earlier type of Buddhism, moving to Mahayana Buddhism, the Vajra Pranya Paramita Sutra, this tiny, um, thirty tiny little thirty-two chapter sutra, definitely seems to be where all of this Mahayana stuff comes from so, so much of, of the ideas, the philosophy, everything. And not even just that, but the, these metaphors. And what I mean is, is that if you're familiar with the Vajrapranyaparamita Sutra, there is a, a refrain. It, it keeps coming back again and again in that sutra. And the Buddha keeps saying this and it, it, it's so fun. These sutras are so funny. And I say this all the time about how funny Buddhism is and about how funny these sutras are. And it's, and it's going to be a really great day. <laughs> like it's going to be a really fun day when, when everybody realizes how funny these are. And, you know, have you ever, have you ever gotten you know, in, like we do this sometimes as a, as a kid, as, as children, but it's like, um, you know, this kind of one-upmanship, if, 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 if you've got a, if you've got a, a raft, I've got a dinghy, if you've got a dinghy, I've got a boat, if you've got a boat, I've got a ship, if you've got a ship, I've got a air, you know, a, a, you know, and just this idea of like kind of getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. That type of funny um, one-upmanship, but in a playful way, not in an artistic way. Like who can think of something bigger than, than a yacht? Who can, you know, it's like that type of fun play with language and ideas is very much at play in this. And, and I mean, for lack of a better term, call it hyperbole, but 
what the Buddha does in the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra repeatedly is this hyperbolic statement about if, if someone were to fill a world system, and not just a world system, but if someone were to fill, pack, pile a trichiliocosm, a billion worlds, three great thousand world systems, if they were to pack them full of the seven treasures. And it's like, wow, Shibuti, that's a lot of treasures, right? That's a lot of the seven treasures. Yes, we're honor one. That's a lot of treasures, This, you know, the Vajra Sutra reads. And the Buddha says, well, if somebody were to pack a trichiliocosm full of the seven treasures and start giving them away in dana, as in generosity, here you go, you need an emerald, you need a ruby, you need a this, you need some gold, you need some silver, you need some lapis, giving it away. The Buddha says repeatedly in the sutra that if somebody were to actually just take four lines of the sutra and explain them to somebody else, it would be more valuable. It would be actually give them more merit than giving away all the jewels in all the uh, packed into a trichiliocosm. And this keeps going. And this is what's uh, fun about the Vajra Sutra is that this analogy keeps going and going until by the end of the sutra, <laughs> the Buddha says, hey, Shibuti, if someone were to take a trichiliocosm, and were to grind it, all of it, into minute particles. And there were as many trichiliocosms as there are minute particles of a ground up trichiliocosm. And then somebody filled all of those world systems with the seven treasures and gave it away, practicing giving. And somebody just learned four lines from the Vajra Sutra. It would be better than all of that. <laughs> so my, one of my interpretations of having a vision of a trichiliocosm full of hidden treasuries, it has to do with this, um, with that, that a tiniest bit of wisdom is worth all the treasure in the world, not only, not even all the treasure in the world, all the treasure in worlds upon worlds upon worlds. And that vision of what is really valuable, that I think has a little bit to do with this vision of the Bodhisattva. All right. Questions, comments, answers, and ideas about that reading of this. Are you feeling okay with that one? Cool. Let me just. Thanks for explaining the, the, the what I was. Thanks Which for explaining the, the continuing like the hyperbole, hyperbole, hyperbole. Yes. That is pretty great. It's totally great. It's in my estimation, it is totally meant to be fun and funny, but deeply instructive. And that's of course upaya, you know, to be fun and funny, but deeply instructive in that way. All right. Everybody ready for the next interpretation of the jewels in the world? Okay. So this, this next one, it has a lot to do with what I've been talking about, which is that this Akshayamati Bodhisattva Sutra is a, <clears throat> a, it's a very small sutra that's part of this collection, but what <clears throat> the, the 10 stages and what it's explaining is really the, 
the message of the Avatamsaka Sutra. So this sutra is about the 10 Bhumi stages. It's about the practices of the Bodhisattva. And this sutra talks a lot about jewels within worlds, within worlds, within worlds. It's like, it's part of the way, I mean, you want to talk about hyperbole, look at how big this is. You know what I mean? So it's like, we're dealing with hyperbole in that sense. So this sutra, the Akshayamati Bodhisattva Sutra, is a summary of the philosophy of the Avatamsaka Sutra. So this um, vision, it, it, what I'm getting at is that if you read the Avatamsaka Sutra, you yourself will be exposed to worlds upon worlds filled with hidden jeweled treasuries. It's, it's very much a part of um, the experience of reading that sutra is, is kind of being exposed to this type of imagery. And there's a way in which if you are captivated by that, if you get that, if you're like, oh, oh, I get it. They're not sci-fi freaks. Oh, I get it. They're not um, jewelry fanatics and jewels like oh jewels mean this and world systems are subjective opinions and all of that like if you get that they're being both philosophical and you know very poetically beautiful that's the avatamsaka sutra and so there's also a way a t like this is I, i'm i'm inserting this interpretation um having a vision, the Bodhisattva first having a vision of a trichiliocosm filled with jeweled hidden treasuries, that could sort of also mean exposure to the ideas of this sutra. Just letting you know that that could be code in that way. In the sense of being exposed to this hyperbolic way of seeing and thinking. So I just wanted to put that one out there, that that connection. Um, that's Claire, sort of like, yeah. I have a question um, in regards of connection. Uh, I just came to my mind that at least in Vajrayana Buddhism, you take refuge, maybe you've mentioned it earlier and I, I missed it, but um, you take refuge in the three jewels in Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. Um, what is the connection to the jewels that you're talking about? Is there a connection? Mind, mind blown. Connie, mind blown. Oh my God, the jewels. I mean, and in, indeed, that's, it's like, it, what, what, and I'm not joking, by the way, mind blown. Um, but what my mind is being blown about, it refers back to that interpretation I was giving you about value and how to the unenlightened, gold, silver, and rubies are valuable. Ha <laughs> ha, I got them all. To the enlightened, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. That's, those are jewels. Those are value, invaluable. And indeed, that's why they're kind of called jewels, but you're connecting it to this larger discourse on jewels and value, again, is, is I, I live for these moments, frankly. When, when my mind is blown. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Woo, yeah. Um, so keep thinking, think, keep thinking about that <laughs> uh, and all of that. And, and now let me sort of try to tie together this sort of grander, the grand, the grand vision here, uh, possibly. So you just keep in mind this sort of um, um, keep in mind that any you know anything I've said about Avatamsaka uh, Buddhism is at play here, and what I mean by that is that sutra and the type of Buddhism that kind of comes out of that sutra is very famous for 
the sutra is very famous for articulating what's called the interpenetration of all dharmas. This is like a fundamental idea of that sutra, um, that anything, i.e. Uh, any dharma, any concept, any idea, any phenomena, large or small, real, irreal, imaginary, past, present, future, uh, emotional, tangible, physical, it doesn't matter. Any thing, any individuated concept idea, in order to be that idea, actually relies upon all other concepts and ideas, and therefore is interpenetrated by all other ideas. Take, for example, this pencil. This pencil, while it is an individuated phenomena, it, it very much is dependent upon a hand. It, it only makes sense in a world of hands. It's what it's designed, even though it's just a, a, line, a line, even though it's just like this, it's designed this way to fit right in there. And so there's a way in which this dharma, this idea, is contains this idea, a hand. And it contains a lot of other ideas, like what would you do with a pencil? Well, you would write some words, write some language, communicate. It goes on and on and on and on and on. And that idea, which I'm not going to fully you know, break that idea down tonight, but that idea that any individual phenomena as a concept is contains and is supported by and ultimately is all these other ideas that type of thinking which in the language of the sutra in the language of this tradition that's called the dharma dot two where all dharmas interpenetrate one another in a very mystical way creating a kind of conceptual monolithic whole of reality where any given thing right is just one aspect of that monolithic whole dependent upon words language paper paper trees water from the sky weather factory i mean it goes on and on and on and on and on but that view of reality, that particular, um, it's very Buddhist, by the way, of course, to view it that way, but articulated in that sense of interpenetrating dharmas, that is, well, it's this idea that, it, it, and again, I, I probably did a very poor example explaining that, and I was relying on this idea that you already knew what I was going to say, right? So, but that idea of any one dharma containing all other dharmas, if you really are kind of on top of that, if you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember when Michael said that, and that's true, then there's a way in which you, this contains the emeralds and the rubies in an actual way. Like it is that in that way that all dharmas contain all other dharmas. And so in the same way that a chunk of gold contains the lead conceptually that would be in my pencil, because last time I checked, gold and lead are both on the periodic table of elements, which is kind of like an alphabet of our reality, <laughs> right? And so they all sort of are part of a matrix of understanding in that way. So that's sort of a very beautiful vision of reality where within the world system, one sees hidden jeweled treasuries that weren't there before. And they're there conceptually, right? They're there conceptually. And well, you know, of course, what the Avatamsaka Sutra is saying is, is that concepts are all we have in that sense. That's why they call it, by the way, the mind-only school. 
in that sense, or that type of Buddhism is called Dinyana Matri or consciousness only. And it's the view of reality as having, as being, um, well, what the German idealists called idea-based, that it was all ideas. And of course the German idealist movement, um, Heidegger, all these guys, the idea is, is that they're on the same ideas the Buddhists were on, that all of these things are concepts at the end of the day. And I wanna kind of keep um, um, repeating this theme tonight, because I think it's at the heart of the vision. And it's that to the unenlightened mind, this is valuable, all of this is not valuable. Right? The majority of elements on the periodic table are not valuable, but these few are valuable. They might be valuable because of their rarity or whatever. And what this, and so again, to the unenlightened person, they're like, ha, I got all the rare, valuable stuff. And all you suckers are over there with the non rare, non valuable stuff. And part of the realization here is, is that all of those ideas are dependent upon one another. And so it's sort of truly unenlightened foolishness to be thinking that you can do that, that you can like hoard the wealth over here. And so the vision of the Bodhisattva about to abide in the first stage of great joy sort of has arguably this overwhelming vision of sort of the jewels everywhere, if you will, <laughs> the value everywhere, if you will, the interdependent value of everything. Yeah, there's a lot um, that also goes along with that idea, but I'm gonna pause it there. Questions, comments, answers, ideas. All good. Yeah, no. Um, I'm, I'm wondering two other, about two other interpretations. One, one of them being that the vision is sort of a vision of what the path might be, like seeing, you know, the, the, uh, it's not a heap of jewels because that's what the whole collection is called, but seeing this many chiliocosms of, of jewels as sort of what might be waiting in a metaphoric way to the, to the mm. Bodhisattva. And then the other, which is kind of a flip of that, which is that the, the Bodhisattva sort of like is done with, with jewels, is done with like this, okay, I've got everything there is in the world now what sort of way of looking at it and sort of that's what they that's where they're coming from hmm. yeah i on the second one yeah on your second thought i definitely it does have a lot to do with i think on that note it has a lot to do with what we were saying before about um, whether it was uh, Connie's beautiful insight about the three jewels, the three treasures of the Buddha Dharma Sangha, or just the idea of like um, um, in, in, in Buddhism a, a lot, they will use the metaphor of the, the teachings of the Buddha as these jewels, these Dharma jewels, right? And if we, if we take that, so if we, if we, let's do that. So let's, and I'm kind of, again, just responding to the second thing you said, Noam, which is like, let's take our ideas of value and totally uh, shift them from ridiculous uh, uh, shiny jewels to wisdom, knowledge, and say, that's what's valuable. So that's the first movement, which puts the Bodhisattva in a very different environment when that's what's valuable. But then, Let's just add on top of that. So yeah, let's stick to our very, our, let's stick to our wisdom jewels, 
our truth wisdom jewels everywhere, right? Add on top of that, this sort of, um, well, uh, the great saying of Confucius, you know, Confucius uh, says, make the wise person your teacher and make the fool your lesson. And it's a great saying. And the, the point of that message is that we have something to learn from everyone. If they are a master, then you have something to learn that you don't know. And if somebody's a fool, you can learn a lot about how not to talk to people, about how not to behave, about how not to, you know, it goes on and on. And so on that level, where wisdom and knowledge is our precious commodity, it's everywhere to be had in that sense. And I would kind of throw that back to you, Noam, as a uh, response to what you, the second part of what you said. The first part, I'm not sure. I know what you're saying, that it's sort of about the path and, and that, but I don't know. Well, as I, after I said it, I thought, I think where that thought is coming from is that, you know, the, the idea that you're on the path more generally, not the Bodhisattva path, has to do with seeing its value like as you know this idea that when you see the value of the path then you're hooked and you're you know you're going to keep going right um that's sort of the the way i'm thinking of it i'm with you on that and and what i'm thinking about is actually of course um what we're not going to get to tonight is that each of the stages is preceded by a vision a different vision and it's what get it's where this sutra gets very interesting and very kind of again almost mystical and jungian where the bodhisattva is having these kind of visions and what i think is fun is to try to break down what these visions uh, mean in that way and i think you're on to something gnome in terms of the way these visions sound that this first one is more about what you're describing is this kind of um what awaits in that sense, for sure. Any other thoughts, ideas? So my kind of another, it's, um, it's a reading, it's a reading of this, but it's actually, I wanna start kind of putting this back into context in terms of that this is the vision that a bodhisattva will have right before or before they enter the first stage of great joy. And that's what we talked about last time, this idea of pramudita. And well, I think, you know, what I wanna remind you of is what I said last time is that these stages that, that they sort of represent these sort of um, plateaus in a way, right? These successive plateaus of, of, of progress. And the way that I mentioned it last time, just to, to remind you, is that I drew this as a ladder where these are 10 rungs on the ladder. And the idea being that if you were below that rung, you would need to use it to pull yourself up. And in that sense, each of these rungs are one of the paramitas, one of the perfections. And so in order to get up onto the first stage of pramudita, you use or practice or cultivate dana or giving. That's the first paramita. And what I explained last time, last week, was that the 10 paramitas that we spent weeks and weeks, you know, weeks discussing, those paramitas correspond to these 10 stages, but in that way that you use the paramita to pull yourself up. And once you're up there, you now stand firmly on the stage 
the first stage. So you use the paramita to pull yourself up and then you are then established there. So the first paramita is this idea of generosity or giving. And what the sutra, what the Akshaya Mata Bodhisattva Sutra is saying, and what the Avatamsaka Sutra is saying, and what the whole Mahayana Sutra is saying, <laughs> is that the first step on the path to enlightenment is giving what I've described as a, a disposition of generosity. It is not necessarily about physically giving money or gifts, or it's not even about the, the thing or who, but it's about the disposition of generosity. And that disposition of generosity can pull oneself up to this great joy. And the thing that I, I think for me, and again, this is all interpretation, you know, but for me, when I read this, and as I think about the stages and the paramitas, I go back to the unenlightened mind that is like, I've got all the rubies, I've got all the emeralds, ha ha. And it's this idea and it's so funny, you know, and it, I've probably said this at some point, but it's worth repeating. And it's how, you know, we've got it all backwards. We've got it all twisted, you know. The, I, what I mean is, is that there is one mentality, one way of looking at it, which is that great joy, great happiness, comes from the acquisition of things. And whether those things be stuff or even experiences, vacations, what have you, there's this idea that happiness comes from this one, gathering. The movement towards one's self. There's an idea that that's how you get happy, is by bringing things towards oneself. And there's an even kind of extension of that idea that if you somehow really hold on, you'll get happier somehow or something like that. But my point is, is that there's a view, call it unenlightened, that great joy comes through this. And the great realization of the bodhisattva is that great joy comes from this way. The exact opposite. The exact opposite. And I would, I would want to sort of put those ideas together with all of these jewels and our conversation about value and what's valuable, what's not valuable. And this idea that not only, not only do we maybe have our idea of value wrong, which is that we value lustrous, rare items and not wisdom or something like that. So what, what we are valuing might, might be off. But then even, so that's one level, that what are we valuing in this world? And then the second movement or the second part of it is it, and then once there's the value, are we trying to hoard it and bring it towards us and be the smartest person in the room? Meaning, ha ha, all the knowledge is for me. I'm smart, you're dumb, ha ha. Or am I trying to give the knowledge and the wisdom away? So, that's two different things, right? What do we value? And then how, what's our disposition towards it? Are we trying to gather as much of it for ourselves as possible? Or are we trying to dispense as much of that as possible? And I would, I would suggest that the Bodhisattva who's just about, he just about to abide in the stage of great joy realizes that it's not about moving this way towards oneself. It's actually about going that way. And what is valuable is not what I thought is valuable. 
that's my kind of interpretation of the Bodhisattva having this kind of wild vision. Anybody questions, ideas about that? That was a pile of jewels right there. I blush. Thank you. It's what we're talking about, though. It's really what we're talking about. We're talking about we're talking about jewels. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, you know, frankly, I don't really have too much more to say about this one. We're kind of well covered in that sense. Um, only, only as a follow-up, only as a follow-up to that idea, I want to remind you all that this first stage that we're talking about is called pramudita, right? And so we're translating this as extreme joy or great joy, which is sort of, that's the normal way. But I wanna remind you that mudita, the, the root of this word pramudita, this mudita, is what we're talking about actually is this empathic joy. So it's actually not about one's joyfulness. Um, it's, it's not about how stoked I am right now <laughs> doing this, which by the way, I'm always stoked every Sunday night doing this. But what I'm particularly stoked about is when people have great ideas and people seem excited about what I'm talking about and getting excited about the Dharma. It's like then that's my mudita is when I'm really stoked for everybody else having a good time here and, and maturing. So I wanna make clear that mudita in early Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism, Tantric Buddhism, mudita, that it's not about this joy. It's this joy for others. And it's a very deep idea of, of emp empathy, empathy, right? This like um, in, the, in the Buddhist tradition, when they describe mudita, it's about um, the, the way the way it's described in the Buddhist tradition, mudita, it's like, you know how a parent is excited when their child does well? And they, it's like the, it's not that the joy is that they're like, you know, and some parents of course are like, you know, egotistical, like my child's so good. But usually the idea is, is that the parent is actually like stoked that the kid succeeded. It's like the actual like joy for their child. And what the Buddhists describe is actually having that same feeling towards everybody. That you are, when you hear somebody else has done well, you're as excited as, as if your own child had done that. It's, it's actually the exact opposite of being a hater, frankly. Like, Anybody that actually, when they hear of other people's success, if you're bitter or resentful, that's not mudita at all. In fact, it's the exact opposite of mudita. <laughs> so there's being bitter and jealous about other people's success. And then there's being very happy, honestly, truly empathically happy for other people, like actually feeling like, yes, yes, the world's getting better. We can do this. <laughs> like. That's the idea of the empathic joy that the Bodhisattva has. And so I wanted to remind you about that in terms of this being established in the first stage of not just mudita now, pramudita. This is like uber mudita. We might as well just translate it as uber mudita, right? Super uber mudita. But the idea is still that the Bodhisattva is is still joyful for the other in that way. And that should all make perfect sense regarding that unenlightened view of, oh no, it's just about my happiness and I will get it by hoarding these rare valuables. My great hope is that at this point, 
hoarding great valuables for oneself seems like the most ridiculous thing in the world. That's my 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 hope for, for this Dharma talk. It's like, yeah, why would anybody hoard rare valuables for themselves? Like what? <laughs> <laughs> which of course is the entire uh point of banks <laughs> and, and everything right so we do sadly live in a world where everybody is hoarding rare valuables for themselves but <laughs> there's hope there's hope yeah no um since we have a minute I was yeah yeah i kind of have a question if I, I want to make sure I understand this right that like the structure of this ladder and is that the Bodhisattva does the practice that we spent the first many weeks on the paramita the so in this in the first case the generosity and that on the on the by the force of that they pull themselves up to this first stage of pramudita and but before they do that they had the vision of the jewels right mm -hmm. that, you said that that so so for each stage there's going to be a vision that they have before they get there right yes and then is this uh is this uh sutra or are you going to talk at all is it like a like once they get to that boomy, are they just like hanging out in it? Like, I don't know what I'm imagining. Like, like they're just like being radiating Pramudita until they get to the next one. <laughs> or... You you ask an interesting question, Noam. Um, and actually, your your question allows me to say something that I wanted to say which is that if, if you were to go back just a few pages to the beginning of the sutra, the whole, this whole thing started with this interesting language of, um, of actually, we spent the first few sessions talking about this idea, which is it's, there's this idea in Mahayana Buddhism, it's a very important idea that we talked about, which was the initial determination for enlightenment. And in particular, it's actually the initial determination for supreme, unsurpassable enlightenment, which is what Bodhisattva Akshayamati asks the Buddha about, which is this supreme, unsurpassable, enlightened state of a Buddha. And how do you how do, you do that? And the Buddha says, well, it all starts with the initial determination for enlightenment. And this is a, a, um, um, a very important part of Mahayana Buddhism, that the whole Bodhisattva path begins with the initial determination for enlightenment, supreme unsurpassable enlightenment. And this sutra, interestingly, it speaks of the 10 paramitas in terms of these 10 initiations. If you remember that, it's like, oh, the Bodhisattva initiates their heading towards enlightenment in 10 ways. And so it's a really interesting sutra for the way that it words that. So the idea is, is that the Bodhisattva initiates this enlightenment in these 10 ways regarding these 10 paramitas. And let me be clear about what the initial determination for supreme unsurpassable enlightenment means. There's a way in the early Buddhist tradition, again, the Shravakayana, Hinayana, Theravada type tradition, where the whole entire point of the practice was to gain enlightenment oneself to purify one's own suffering, to end one's own suffering, to enter nirvana oneself. And in no way as a, am I putting it down, but there is a way where it's very self-oriented. I won't say self-centered, but self-oriented that way. 
what makes the Bodhisattva path the Bodhisattva path and Mahayana Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism, is this initial determination for supreme unsurpassable enlightenment, which is actually this extremely altruistic turning of the heart that basically is like, oh, but it would be so much cooler if we all got enlightened. And in fact, I'm willing to like just hang out until that's the case. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, that gets spoken about a lot, this idea that the Bodhisattva makes a vow to not enter Nirvana until all sentient beings have entered Nirvana before them. And, you know, that type of stuff is cliche. I even, my, I don't even like to hear it come out of my own mouth. It's so cliche in that way. And the reason why I don't like to even say it and, and I don't like to speak in cliches is because this is really important. <laughs> We are talking about a, a, it's so radical. And I, and, and I say this a lot and I, I, it's like, but we really need to appreciate, again, an unenlightened mentality that is just looking out for oneself. That is like this, they, you, you look like you're, it's like, oh, stay away, get away from us. It's like, it's so protectionist in that way. And that view of guarding oneself, even if you were to flip it and be like, yeah, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get enlightened. Yeah, I'll get enlightened. It's like, it's still so self-absorbed. But my point is, is that we are self-absorbed. This is the teaching of the Buddha in that way. But to not be, to actually have that altruistic turning of the heart which by the way, begins with dana, it begins with generosity, giving in that way. But to actually have, I mean, yeah, I mean, to actually have like Francis level empathy. And what I mean is St. Francis of Assisi out there talking to the animals, like, like, you know, Francis Assisi wanted to save every little live, living being. And it's like that type of heart that is deeply concerned about all beings, almost if at the expense of themselves in that way, that's what we're talking about. Altruism versus uh, preserve the self. And I've said this in so many Dharma talks, but you know, Buddha came along, the Buddha, Buddhism, whatever came along about 500 BC or so, give or take, doesn't matter. But they appear, the tradition seems to have come along at a point at which evolutionary biology was no longer serving us. And what I mean is, is that we are hardwired to protect the self. We are hardwired to bare our teeth and our fangs to the to fear get away Arr! like we are hardwired and programmed to do that and all sentient beings do that they bare their teeth they get away they 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 latch on to others screw and pr propagate so desire fear all of this is very normal and got us all this far but i think what the buddha might have realized or an aspect of what the buddha realized is that our ability to extrapolate or whatever you want to call it and identify with say the body or identify with my family or my tribe or my nation or my stuff, that ability to identify with something way beyond consciousness, the ability to identify with all of that and then guard it and protect it, 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 it went too far. <laughs> to the point where we are all crazy. And I think that's where the, what uh, Jasper, Jasper, Carl Jasper talked about in terms of the axial age, where all over the world, there were people popping up, these great sages saying, you know what, everybody time out. I think we need a break. And I think the idea, at least from the view that I'm talking about right now, 
is that that protect, protect the self, protect my stuff, uh, hoard food because you never know where your next meal is going to come from. Like that type of mentality just went overload to the point where we were insane, stressed out, anxious, all of this stuff. And the Buddha brought it back to, or is trying to bring it back to that sort of uh, a, a point of stasis or stasis in that sense. Am I doing okay? So I just wanna say that again, maybe at a certain point in the evolution, it made sense to just protect the self, but in this new world we live in starting 500 BC, <laughs> in this new world we live in, the wisdom is that if we actually look out for the whole, it's the best way to look out for the self. If that makes sense. Because we're all in this together now, whether kind of whether we like it or not, in that sense, you know. But the Bodhisattva is just still not really doing it for themselves. They're just totally doing it for everybody else. I speak I speak upayically. Got it. Okay, got it. Got it. <laughs> Good yeah. looking out though, Tanya. All right, folks. So those are the those are the comments and ideas about the first vision of the Bodhisattva. Noam, I didn't entirely address your deeper questions. It's going to be an ongoing question, which is what does it actually mean to abide in the first stage? And so the same question is going to be for what does it actually mean to abide in the second, third? So we'll keep coming back to that idea for sure. Yeah. All right. Um, so by the way, just to let you know where we're going, I don't think we're gonna do one night per vision. I, I, I don't have the artistic ability to keep drawing such elaborate visions by the, cause they keep getting crazier and crazier. So I don't know exactly what'll happen next week, but I, I we're, we will go through all 10 visions, but we might start doing them collectively in that sense. So I just want you to know that. So don't, uh, uh, stay tuned is I guess what I'm saying. <laughs> so. Thanks everybody.